Hey there. So this is the Nature Journal Club Today Shadows. Um, this is going to be really useful for any drawing that you do. When you are, I'll turn this off so we're not initially glaring in everybody's face. All right. But that light will be handy in just a moment. Um, whether you're drawing um, an, a walrus or an aardvark, the light on the body is, and, and how that plays on the body is what's going to give your drawing form. Um, so whether it's a petunia or a pansy, you want to think about how the light is going to play on it. And I'm going to show you some tricks, some generalized tricks about uh, drawing, and then we're going to look at a few specific cases that are going to help you think about how light falls on an actual object and how what you see on a cast shadow on the ground. And so I think you're going to find that both of these are going to be really useful in giving dimension and volume to whatever. So if your drawings look flat, these shadow tricks and the, the shade and the shadow ideas are going to really, really, really help. We're going to start with my assistant, Wevo. And uh, what Wevo is going to be doing is just showing us a few thoughts and ideas about how shadows go on a really smooth object. And then um, Wevo's cousin, um, Wad of Clay, is going to take that to uh, kind of how things happen on an angular surface. And then we're going to be looking at you know, birds and mammals and all these sorts of things. It's going to be fun. Are you ready? So lights. Camera. There we are. And action. Um, now, I'm going to take our camera and just rock it over on its side here. Back this up a little bit. There we go. Now, here we are. There, there, there. Now we're talking. All right, so there's, there's Huevo. And I have, I have a light here. And um, what we're going to do is just look at a few different features of what happens as I move this light source around on, on the egg. So let's take a really close look at the egg. And we're going to just notice a few little interesting things about how light falls on the egg. Notice that in this area right here, there's sort of a line from where it goes in shadow to in light. It's, it's fuzzed out, it's smoothed out over this area, but you could, you could essentially draw a line, you know, somewhere right in there is where you're going from light to dark. Um, as the objects move, where that little boundary is, um, is going to change. But you, and the flatter the side, you notice when I have my, my egg turned this way, we seem to have a, a larger area in here where that transition is made. If I just tilt my egg this way, um, especially right in there, you see, you can, you could draw a little line across the egg separating where it's light and dark. We tend to, we, you know, we, in, in classes you'll learn about sort of smoothing your pencil out and, and what people tend to do is they'll take their shadow and just blur and blend it out into the light area. And they forget that you actually are often seeing a shape. Shadows have shapes. And once you start looking for the shape of the shadow, you're really going to begin to give your object a lot more form. So, Step one in understanding shadows is it's not just there's a dark side, there's a light side, and you want to smoothly blend between them. But the big news flash here is that there's an edge to that shadow, right? And it may be soft, or if an object like wad of clay here has an angle on it, right? I put wad of clay out, right? And look at how sharp this angle, this shadow is here, coming right in there, and then bam, right along there. Because wad of clay has more planes, all right, I'm gonna just take wad of clay and make some planes and surfaces. You're going to get, um, if you're, the, the, the sharper the planes are on an object, the sharper the edges of your shadows. 
So when you're putting in shadows, you are carving your object. You're showing, you're revealing whether it has smooth edges or whether it has planes. So that's, that's going to be huge in giving your drawings form. But let's take a little bit more, a look at the, the, the details of the shadow themselves. We've already seen that there's that line. Can I learn that person? Thanks, honey. Right? So I've got this line right in here, right? And um, that line actually has a name. <laughs> so um, the official name for the, the, the boundary between light and dark is the terminator, right? That is the terminator. And so I have my terminator, I have my dark side, my light side, and I'm also going to um, um, point out another sort of thing. If just sort of looking up into this area here, if my object is fairly dull, I will have a brighter area and it will fade into a lighter area and that will fade then across the terminator into darkness. Um, I have an area, so up in here is my general lighter area, and over here I've got some of my darker area. I'm going to move this and see if I can block more light from behind, all right? Um, down here underneath, all right, I have, um, I have down here in this zone, you see my darkest shadow, um, that is... Uh, where it is the, the where my, my shadow is closest um, to the, the object that it's, it's, it's sitting on. You also will see that in the dark part, sort of right up in this zone here, take a real close look. In this zone here, not all the way out here, but actually in this zone here, is going to be my, my darkest area of that. So actually, I, oh, I can point with this. Here you go. Emily, you can use this now. Right? So I can point with this. So if you look right in here, there's a real dark shadow in here. Yeah, right in here where everything is occluded, um, but also kind of in this zone here. This area you'd expect Jack, to be the... Jack, we're not seeing where you're pointing. Oh, I thought my pointer... Not on, not on this. Oh, so not sad. Not on the IP, though. It shows up on your, um, on your computer screen when you're sharing a screen with the computer. Uh, okay. Like using, using that wooden pointer should work. Okay. Sorry, I use that again? <laughs> nice All right. So um, back here, um, so sort of in this area here, notice that there's sort of darker shadow in this area, and it actually gets lighter towards the end where the light isn't. What's going on with that? Isn't that weird? There's light on this side, this back side. You'd expect it just to get darker towards this edge, but it doesn't. And that will be even more extreme when I replace this black piece of felt with, look at this, watch, watch, that, watch that white zone. Oh, you see that? All right, look at, look at this. I put Wevo on top of a light surface Oh man, look at that now. Look Heck, at would you be able to tilt, I'm sorry, would you be able to tilt the camera just slightly so we could see the lower shadow? Um, let me try. Uh, no, I don't that, want that. No. That's better. That's better? Yeah. All right. So, I still am seeing that there's kind of a darkest part of my shadow is actually somewhere in here. Th sorry, this, this zone here. What's going on is that this bright white piece of paper is reflective. So light coming from my light source here is coming over to the egg. And notice how that, that sort of can change with different positions. So this is kind of neat. You can see it really nicely here. Look right in here. There's my darkest. My darkest zone is right in there. In here, I actually have a reflection. And then where, where my shadow tucks up under the object, it gets super dark in there. But in this part in here, there's my darkest part of my shadow. 
It's not where we'd expect it to be. So shadows, you've got the light coming here, but some light is coming past the egg, hitting the paper, and bouncing off the paper to this side of the egg. So that's reflected light in there. Reflected light actually picks up colors. If I put a green object next to whatever I'm looking at, all right, I'm reflecting green light in there. If I put a red object in there, I can, so you'll, your shadows will actually have colors in them that are not just, not just you know, dark of shadow, but shadows will be picking up reflected color from whatever surface is below them. Pretty cool. Um, one other thing, I, I just licked the egg. Don't worry, I washed it before. And now what do you see? Now what do you see? So I lick the egg, giving it a shinier, smoother surface, and look at that highlight. Look at that highlight. Now, notice where the egg is brightest, and notice where the highlight is. That highlight is not necessarily in the middle of the brightest area. Isn't that weird? So I always thought that the highlight was just another word for the middle of the brightest area. It's not. The highlight is the, um, is the, has to do with not where, which side is being hit by the light. The highlight is the light hitting the object and then bouncing directly back to your eye. And those are different things. Those are different things. So the, the location of your highlight is, can be, doesn't have, uh, often is not gonna be in the zone that is the brightest. That really weirded me out the first time I saw that, because I just thought, you know, you go from lighter to darker, and maybe you put in a, high, in a reflected light, and highlight was just the center of the brightest area on the light side, but it's not. Different phenomena going on. Again, you have just the light in the dark, which is due to where the light is hitting, where the highlight is has to do with the angle of your eye. Notice as I move the camera around, your, that's your eye, the highlight is actually traveling to all sorts of different point, points. Look at this. So you've got highlight. You can see where is the brightest part of the egg, right? That's not necessarily where the highlight is. Isn't that crazy? Really fun, really fun. So those are a few, thank you, Wevo. Um, a few things that you can, we want to kind of keep in mind when we are playing with lights and shadows. Now, let's turn our attention to some critters. You say, well, that's all very well and good theory. And should I want to draw an egg? And yes, drawing the egg is part of your homework, but we don't want to leave it there. Um, let me see here. Screen share, keynote, and let's share this with you. All right. So I want to take a look at, um, here I will hide. All right. So I want to take a look at how shadows fall on the bodies of real critters. For this, the best way to do this, and it's actually really easy for all of us to do now, is you do a Google search for albino animals. So you can do a search for albino deer, albino hawk, albino sparrow, whatever it is. You do a search for the albino critter, and you will get um, all sorts of photographs that help you so just look at light and dark. Um, when you're looking at these, you wanna keep a few things in mind. So thing number one is that you're gonna have different light angles on the subjects. And also some of these are going to be taken in overcast light and some are going to be taken in um, direct sunlight. Generally speaking, photographers 
love taking photographs on days when there's, it's a little bit overcast because it just sort of gives these soft shadows to everything around them. But um, we, sometimes that can obscure a little bit of the form. So both of these photographs of uh, these deer were taken on an overcast day. You'll notice that sort of, remember like the, under the base of the egg, these sort of areas in here were kind of really tucking into dark, darker places. You can see how that just kind of gives a little bit of form right here to, to what you're looking at. A little bit of shadow right here under the chin helps you see that this muzzle sticks out of the head, right like that. Um, you see a shadow here where the shoulder blade and the humerus meet right down here. That's its shoulder. And right there, very, very nice shadow along the belly and, and here. So these, these photographs with rather indistinct shadows were taken on an overcast day. Overcast days just kind of give this soft sort of general lighting to thing. The light ends up kind of bouncing around in the clouds. And so it hits the animal at several different angles simultaneously. Now, oops, wrong way. This crow is, it's in the shade. So there's just light filtered through a little bit from the sky and through the tree. But you can see how you generally are getting a shadow on the underside, sort of where things like the edge of the wing come down, there's a little shadow below that, but nice sort of soft edged shadows. Here, a shadow underneath the far wing, a little shadow right here along the edge of the scapular feathers. And this is with indirect soft lighting. The more direct the light is, the sharper the shadows are going to be. So this crow was brought indoors and the photographer took a photograph of it with, they had a lamp set up. You can actually see the reflection of the lamp right there in its eye. And then what they did is they, on the other side, there was their assistant standing there. Their assistant was holding um, the assistant was holding a big white sheet to get a little bit of reflected light here. So you had one light source, the lamp. You can actually see the little bit of the reflection of the white sheet over here. So that's what's kind of lighting up this side a little bit here. Otherwise, it would just kind of go to darkness. So there's a um, little bit of reflected light in this, these sort of studio portraits here. But you see how sharp and crisp some of those shadows can be. Overcast light, very often right here below the wing, above the undertail coverts and the rump here, you get a little shadow coming down. Try squinting at this screen. Squint at the screen and you'll see that there's kind of a, you can see the edge of the light coming down here. There's sort of a scoop of light, right like that. You have a darker core shadow here. And you have reflected light right in there. Here's where your core shadow is. So you are getting darker as you come in here, a big value change here. And the reason for that big value change is that there is a change in angles. Remember lump of clay, there's a change in angles right in here. And so you get a fairly quick transition from this bright highlight into darker. Now we're looking at an animal on, with bright, clear light, right? So with bright, clear, clear sunlight, we have nice crisp shadow here. And look how quickly you go from light to dark. You could just draw a thin pencil line separating the light and the dark here. You go from light to dark. But you know, if you had, we're just sort of following some shadow formula, you would smooth this over, kind of slowly blend darker into light. And you lose the fact that you're actually looking at the edges of planes on the side of this. This is a little bit of a smooth transition here. This is a lump of feathers here. And you are seeing a more sort of gentle transition of light into dark here. But look at how much of this is sharp edges. Again here, bright sunlight. So look on the head. You have an edge to the shadow, an edge to the shadow. 
because of the planes of the head. You'll see the shadow of the head cast across the neck here. There is its quadriceps muscle is a little bit flexed in here. You're getting this big triangular shadow coming down here and a sharp shadow right there. All right. So shadows will often make very, very bold marks on your critter. Here, I'm transferring now into more side light. So this is in the evening. Light is coming across this field like this, catching this side of the head, nice sharp angles here. Look at that wonderful reflected light, right? There's your core shadow. So you're gonna blend in there. There's your terminator line. There's your core shadow. There's your reflected light. So this sort of looking for these, on your critter, that's what's going to give you your animal form. So do I have, do I have a sharp transition or not? Squint at this neck here and look at how this dark area has a shape. It comes down here, it scoops up here, over here, and back down like that. Right? So the dark area actually has a shape. Squint at the head. I have a dark patch here. I have another line that comes down straight to the muzzle. The brighter the sunlight, the sharper the contrasts between these zones. Look at this. There's just this wonderful sharp edge between these. Um, but it would unless you are expecting shadows to do these sorts of things, what we tend to do is we just sort of blur out those shadows. Squint at this and look at how dark this belly is relative to this back. You really see those values when you squint. It would be very, very easy to draw this animal and not really punch in those shadows as much as you should. Here we have another critter, sharp angle, sharp angle, sharp angle, right? So a general strategy that I have for drawing critters, and I'll put uh, some pencil to paper in just a moment, is that I will um, sketch in my critter, and then I, if I'm looking at a, a, a real wild thing, I'm going to assume that more often than not, my shadows are making sharp edges, and I will look for the terminator line of my shadow on whatever it is I'm drawing. So on the head here, it would come over, it's gonna turn down, maybe kind of tuck towards me a little bit right when it hits the top of the nose. It's going to come down here, have a little projection of light in here, second projection flat over here, all right? Flat down here, up, flat shelf, down again to here, steeply down here, right? So I'm going to look at that as a line and I'm going to lightly, underscore lightly, draw that line in on my piece of paper. So I'll put my shadow in. I don't want to overdo it, but I'm also not gonna underdo it. Oh, that was helpful information. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. All right, um, yeah. Um, so I, I, I want it to be bold enough to give my drawing structure, but not so bold that it obscures everything else. Right. Here we see another look at Look, look at that wonderful little bit of that, that edge of the light there. So when you're working on your terminator line here, right? Um, you know, that, that really does so much just to carve the form of whatever animal you're looking at. And you'll see the same thing too when you're looking at birds. Here's a little backlit kestrel. So it's got white around the top of its head here, around the edge of the belly here, the core in darkness. Oh. So I'm just going to go back to, let's see who would be a good subject. This one, this one might work well for us. Um, so Melinda, question for you, um, yes. can, can people, um, uh, can, can, can people 
see this screenshot and my document camera at the same time? Yes, and I'm just, I typed it in there earlier, but um, if, it, if you go to your view options up on top, there's a little black box with a, a, tr a triangle it's pointing down. If you click on that, that gives you an option to do um, side by side mode. And if you click on that, you can um, see the deer and Jack's um, picture at the same time. Can you, the area which I have framed in my fingers, is that in the screen? Um, let me see, you should be able to, so if you do side by side mode, you'll see the deer on one side. Oh, wait, wait, here I go. Nice. Hold on one second. Um, okay. I think, let's see. So um, actually my, my, my first question is, if does, is that gonna work on all devices? So if people have- So if, no, if you have a device, you, you'll have to select between the drawing and the image of the deer. But for people on computers, they can do a side by side. So you can just swipe back and forth between the drawing and the deer. So when Jack's talking about the deer, you just swipe over to it. And I'm gonna ask people, please not to use the annotation feature um, uh, that the, the, the make marks that will show up on our, our screen here. And we're gonna to try to avoid that. And there's also um, an option, you can make the picture bigger. So you'll see the percentages, you can um, zoom into, well actually, um, maybe we just keep it to the middle because it, it just kind of moves the picture around, but you can also zoom in. Um, so it, is that, so is that going to, um, again, let's not use the annotation feature that is going to uh, make marks on the screen. Um, actually, why don't, why don't um, so, is, is that, okay, let's just sort of check in the chat that that is working for everybody. Um, and if not, I'll just jump back to the back and toggle back and forth. So the Jack, it might, it might be better for you to just go to your uh, main screen, your, your, the drawing. Okay. And then if you need to point to the, the deer to, that you swap out, because it'll just give bigger pictures for each of us, because we're going to have to share the Got one it. screen with two pictures. Got it. Okay. Are we, now we're all back on my main, main screen. All right. All right, so you are seeing this screen with my hand? Yes. Great. So um, I'm going to just sort of walk you through how I would kind of block in a mammal here and um, then, and, and I'll do a, a, a bird and we will, um, Um, so for, for when I'm drawing a mammal, what I often do is I start with just the line across its back, you know, whatever, what is the shape of the negative space on the back of the animal? And then, um, I will place my head and I'll think about how far is that head from the body. So at the start, I'm just sort of thinking of what are the general proportions between this kind of rectangle of a body and, and my head that's sticking up here. Um, I have a tendency to make my necks way too long. Um, and so a good way to, to, to think about that is where is the bottom of the head relative to the line of the back here? And in this one, I made mine way too long. So once I said that, I realized actually my head should be right in here. What happens is you end up looking at this part of the neck and you make this part of the neck that long. So you kind of get a Garanuk or a little giraffe hybrid. Um, so my, my head is going to be kind of in here. So that's a very useful frame of reference. How, how high above the back is your head going to be? All right, um, so for my body, the front legs generally come down as posts, belly curves up, the back leg. Jack, would you slide the picture just slightly up? Thank you so much. Thank you. Back leg has an angle that comes down a little bit more thick and then pops down. 
upper part of the legs here is often a little bit thicker than the lower part. And so these are my, my general proportions. I'm going to switch over to another kind of drawing pencil. Um, and I have the head pointing down this direction. Um, sometimes it's useful to put a little diamond in, um, a little diamond in on the top of the forehead. So here is the front of my little critter's nose. It has a head that comes up. Jack, can I interrupt just for a moment? There's a um, handful of people who are requesting to see the deer. They, they can't draw along unless they see the deer picture. <clears throat> All right. Um, it's the, uh, let's see, I wonder is what is the best way to, to do this? Because we either have, you either have the, the, the thing on the screen, maybe so I'll you can you can set your main camera to the IPVO and that that'll focus on the drawing. And then if you share the screen with the computer, you'll be able to show the picture of the deer, just like you did earlier. It's okay. just that it's going to be a smaller picture, and it sounds like the people who are commenting are ones that want to be able to see the picture, even if the picture is small. All right. So does this? So, um, and, and, and there's a way of, is there a way of making one of these the major one? Yes, you can, each individually can slide. There's a um, gray line that shows up. If you put your mouse between the two screens for, these are only for people on computers. There's a gray line, that show, vertical gray line that shows up. And if you grab that with your mouse, you can slide it back and forth. So you can adjust the picture larger and smaller as many times as you want throughout this video. <clears throat> so that's how you can get a better view of the drawing. So I've got an ear that sticks up. I've got an ear that sticks out for the head. I'm just leaving that as sort of a large triangular mass, but it's going to have, later on I'm gonna have fun with its, its shadow. The neck curves down. Actually, I'm gonna have it come down straighter and then into the body. Um, The, um, so my back, I have a bump and a bump. In the front, there's the, the, the legs don't attach right here at uh, the, the front of the body. They're in a little bit. So you have the so the pectoral area sticking out here. Tuck up here. On the back of the leg, the negative shape between the, on the calf here, kind of coming in here, there's this, this nice little curve. Critter's tail sticks down. So for, for light and shadow, um, what I want to do with this sort of terminator line, um, I'm going to have the whole forehead in light. And then that comes down here. On the neck, I'm going to put in a spike of white, a second spike of white. 
I'm going to then wrap over this shoulder area and come up. I'm going to go over and then tuck it around the end of the rump. There's a little bit of um, white on the, the, the edge of the um, the edge of the tail there, but that puts all these other parts. So I actually am, I'm drawing in that line. And so if let's say I've got a, a bird in front of me, we'll have other workshops again on drawing birds. The light will also be kind of coming in from the same angle on this bird. What I'm going to be doing is very much the same thing, but when I'm putting in this shadow line, I just have, I've got my bird, my bird's contours to think of. It's got undertail coverts in here. It's got breast feathers that are coming in here. So what might that look like on, on a bird? Well, um, I might have it sort of follow along the edge of the, the throat here, coming up onto the chest. Um, here underneath the wing, there's going to be, the wing is going to cast a big shadow. Um, so I'm going to come here, kind of a scoop along the side of the body here. And that would be sort of where my light and shadow areas would be. I'm now going to, um, and then what I do is if I am painting these, I will put in the shadows first. Um, if, I, if I do something like I, I, I finish a drawing and then I go ahead and put shadows on it, um, sometimes it works. Very often it gets me into trouble. Because let's say I've worked out all these details and things that I like. When I go to put um, shadow on top of that, right? Then um, sometimes, if everything's nice and dry and I only hit it with one coat, I can get away with it, right? But very often, it is going to, what will start to happen is the details in this area will start to lift and mix and, and I'll start to kind of make a mess of, 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 of what I've got. Especially the more that I go over it with one coat of paint after another, after another, after another. Jack, so, is there a way that you can zoom out on, on this image? People are requesting to see the rest of the painting. Um, no, there we go. Thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, this, um, so, you can sometimes get away with kind of after the fact shadows, but I find um, very often I will, you know, you know, I then have to go back and reestablish details and things that I had put in my shadow side. And just because those, those had that, that coat of watercolor paint had disrupted that, so much. So that's why my approach now is to start with, I start with my shadows first. Um, so I'm going to set this aside. I'm also starting with the shadows really just helps, you'll find that it's going to just begin to give form and structure to whatever it is that you're looking at very, very quickly. 
Um, and if you're looking at things that are in natural bright light, then those it's going to be especially useful to you because um, often the contrast is just so strong. All right, so I'll put in, you'll see that how, now the color that I'm using here is a mixture of just schmutz that's on my gunk that's on my palette here. And I tend to draw heavily from a color uh, by Daniel Smith called Shadow Violet, and it is a little purple gray color. And the reason that I use that purple gray color is that it blends very, very well with a whole host of other colors. If, as my shadow color, I use a color that is kind of leans towards the blue end of the spectrum, then it will, um, then when I, if I put anything on it that is slightly sort of has a yellowish cast, my drawing will turn green. And so using something that's sort of a go-to generic, if you're going to have a generic color for shadows, um, in, which of course you'll then modify if you've got reflected light of different sorts of colors, if there's some, if it's near the water, maybe it's getting blue reflected up into a lot of parts of its body. But the, 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 the purple does such a nice job of blending smoothly with other colors that it is a, a, a great kind of go-to thing. Um, I'm going to put some shadows now on the belly of this little bird here. And I'm going to get a little bit of, uh, kind of clean my brush and just take some damp paint and oh, hang on, I need a little bit more paint in there. I want this, I'm going to give not, not quite as dark near that sort of reflective light area. Also, I can punch up the darkness here underneath its wing a little bit. So there I, you know, I've, I've, I've committed to, I've committed to the light um, by putting that, that shadow zone in. Once your shadow colors is, are dry, you can come across them and just and 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 put in uh you know paint directly on top of whatever you have so maybe now making this into more of a, a bluebird I can paint you know, just directly on there, and that shadow pops through. So 
that's my general approach to light and shadows. If I'm not using, uh, if I'm not using uh, watercolor, a soft graphite pencil does a really great job of, of, of carving these sorts of things in. Um, if, if you are, um, though this, then this, that shadow violet, I think is a really um, useful approach to take. Let's try to hold off on um, using the annotation tool. I think we'll have to disable that in the future. All right. Now I'm going to pop out of stop share and see if I can make my way back to our meeting here. <coughs> I'll just give you a time check. It's 12.53 right now. Great. Okay. Um, so we've, we've looked at some different aspects of shadows. Shadows can actually have colors in them. We um, have looked for um, the, the sort of the idea of reflected light. We talked about um, how finding, thinking about your terminator line as, as, a, as an actual shape in what you have. And that is, uh, for, for me, I think that's the, that's the big piece, is that I've stopped looking at, I've stopped looking at the, um, the, the shadows as this sort of blend and this sort of smooth grade from light to dark. It's got a shape, it's gonna carve whatever form you're looking at. If it's really shiny, you get to put in a highlight. And again, the highlight's not gonna be, it could be, but it's generally not going to be um, right at the spot which is the brightest part of the light side of your object. It would be if you are the sun and your eyes are coming from the same place that the light is coming from. So then it, your eye light would go hit this object and bounce back directly to you. That would mean that the, the, the center zone of your brightest bright, um, the, of the lightest area, the center of that would be right where the highlight is. But if you are not the light source, you're gonna see that highlight actually in a different place. That's wild, isn't that fun? All right, so again, highlight different from just the brightest part um, and if your subject is dull, remember I had to lick the egg in order to get the highlight to show up. If the subject is dull, then you're not going to be seeing those highlights um, in your object. And there is a bag of tricks for your, um, for your, your lights and shadows. So your homework is to go online and find some really fun pictures of albinos, of albino animals. And, um, the, and what you, you want to do um, is to draw the critter and drop in the shadow, paying attention to is this, what is the light direction, and is it light that is, diffuse or is it direct? So those are the, the two things you want to figure out. Is this a direct light source or is it diffuse? And then represent that on the shading on your drawing. Then find, go back online, find the same species that actually has pigment in its feathers or fur and layer those colors on top of the shaded drawing that you've already done. So you're gonna start with a drawing from where it's, you just have the lights and darks and you're playing with those, those, um, those, those values. Put in those shadows, really pay attention to what is my light source, how is this looking, and then see if you can add in your color as a second layer on top of that. Two different drawings doing that, right? For those of you who are overachievers, here are two other little puzzles. Um, do a little bit of research on the side 
and find out the difference between an albino animal and a leukistic, albino and leukistic animals. So they're gonna be different. And you get mad points um, in the field for being able to kind of have that be something that you are, are, are it, it should be part of our naturalist vocabulary. So see if you can get that into your natural, naturalist vocabulary. And you'll discover that a lot of the pictures of albino animals that are online are not albino animals. Right, so and the, my second question is, um, why is it that when you look at the moon at night, you don't see reflected light on that backside? You don't, remember we've got this sort of model of, you know, I'm gonna have this dark side and then on the far side, um, I'm not seeing a zone in there where there's a little kind of paler crescent of, of light. Sometimes when you look at the moon, you can see the light side and you'll see the rest of the face of the moon, right, as, as, as a lighter value when it's a thin crescent. So my, my challenges for you as we're thinking about light bouncing around and doing all the cool things is, uh, so first of all, homework project number one is those two drawings. Homework project number two for the overachievers, albinism versus leucanism. Uh, and number three, is what is up with the moon and um the one of the best ways to, to play with this is just to get an orange or an egg at night take a light in your room turn off all the other lights and hold your egg up your head will be the earth this will be your moon uh, also a, a sort of round ping pong ball may work even better but you can take your egg hold it this way so it's round towards you all right um, and just spin around like this and see if you can figure out what is going on um, when you're seeing those different uh, phases of the moon, the, those different sort of crescent stages. And for the extra sort of bonus points, can you figure out why when it's a thin, thin crescent, you sometimes see the rest of the moon? And why don't we see sort of normal reflected light kind of stuff going on? Right. Similarly, if you watched the, um, the, uh, the, the, the Dragon uh, module come up and dock with the space station, in the dark part, the parts that were in shadow, there wasn't any reflected light. It was just dark. Why was that? So those are a couple of little fun puzzles um, just to sort of take this further. If we're going to be thinking about light darks and all those sorts of things, those are going to be some good ways to go. All right, so there we have it, a little bit on light and shadow.